Hello, my friends, it's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, and today we're going to be talking about titrating IV meds, which is basically, can you follow a doctor's order? So that's really, if you get a question about titrating a med, just say, what's the order, and I'm going to follow it, and also about central lines. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the home of the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe, in my opinion. You know, Clinic Reviews is the organization that oversees this channel. We offer the things on this channel free of charge. These are not the same things that we offer on our paid service. If you go to clinicreviews.com, you can find out uh, what you can pay for. We have a full NCLEX 21 plus hour NCLEX review online on demand. And it's good for you can buy it for however many months you want. We also have a streaming service with all the videos from YouTube plus more that you can pay a monthly fee for. And then we also have small group tutoring and I do participate in the small group tutoring. So let's go ahead and get started with our questions. I think I've got nine questions. A client on norepinephrine has a mean arterial pressure of 58, and the goal is greater than 65. The heart rate is 106. The extremities are warm. After a one liter bolus, what's the priority action? Now, we didn't bolus norepinephrine. We bolus just probably saline, just a, nor, just a isotonic fluid. The norepinephrine is on a continuous drip. Okay, so norepinephrine, think about the sympathetic nervous system. Epinephrine, norepinephrine are uh, neurotransmitters that are part of the sympathetic nervous system, so fight or flight. So it does cause vasoconstriction peripherally, which should increase blood pressure. So this is a medication to increase blood pressure, and the MAP is still 58. The goal is over 65, so it's not high enough yet. Okay, so it's not high enough. The heart rate's 106, which is a little high, but and their their extremities are still warm. So the risk with norepinephrine, if it causes vasoconstriction, is that you can you can actually start to have impaired tissue perfusion of the extremities, and you can actually um, develop gangrene of the toes, uh, the fingers, the nose, and so forth. So what the reason the reason they're telling us they have warm extremities is because we're not vasoconstricting too much here. Okay. All right, so norepinephrine doesn't tell us the dose. It just tells us the map is not where it's supposed to be yet. Decrease norepinephrine to avoid tachycardia. Well, we don't want to decrease it because the map is not where it's supposed to be. Increase norepinephrine per titration protocol. So that's what we want to do. We want to increase it because it's supposed to be greater than 65, the map, and so far it's only 58. Start nitroprusside for afterload reduction. Well, no, nitroprusside lowers blood pressure and we need to get blood pressure up. Mean arterial pressure is systolic plus diastolic plus diastolic divided by three. So it's just really, and the, that's because systolic is one third of the cardiac cycle, diastolic is two thirds of the cardiac cycle. So it's systolic plus diastolic plus diastolic divided by three. So it's basically just a, a mean uh, arterial pressure is what it is, just what it's called. Um, start, no, we don't do that. Bolus with a liter of LR. We already bolused, we already bolused. So we're not gonna do that again. So we're going to increase the norepinephrine per titration protocol. Okay, so you do need to know norepinephrine uh, vasoconstricts. It is what's called a vasopressor. So it's called a vasopressor and it vasoconstricts. A client on a heparin drip has a PTT of 115. The target is 60 to 80. So it's too high. What should the nurse do first? So you should interpret this as the PTT is too high, which means the heparin drip is too high. Continue heparin at the same rate and recheck in six hours. Well, no, the heparin is too high. We need to get it down. Give vitamin K. Vitamin K is the antidote for warfarin, not heparin. Hold heparin infusion per protocol. So that sounds like a good idea. Increase heparin rate per protocol since the client is high coagulable post-op. No, that doesn't make any sense. So we're going to hold it. We're going to hold it per protocol. So you don't like, uh, protamine sulfate is the antidote for heparin. We don't give protamine sulfate when someone's on a continuous heparin drip. We just hold the heparin. We just stop the infusion for whatever period of time it is that they should 
be held for and then restarted at the proper time. While on IV insulin for diabetic ketoacidosis, the glucose drops from 230 to 98 in one hour and the client is drowsy. What is the priority nursing action? All right, so if they're on insulin drip for DKA and it's down to 98, I don't want to give them insulin, right? So I would think I would want to, I'm just talking through this right now. I'm not looking at the answers. I would think in my head we would hold the insulin. Now, if they were alert and oriented, I wouldn't think I'd need to give them anything. But if they're drowsy, we may need to give them some glucose. So let's see what we have here. Stop the insulin and remove the IV. Well, I want to stop the insulin, but I don't want to remove the IV at all. And remember, if the entire answer is not correct, then the answer is not correct. So I like the first half, but the second half is wrong. Give IM glucagon. Um, I suppose I could give IM glucagon, that, um, but they have an IV. So I'm not sure that I'd want to give IM glucagon when they have an IV. And it's the priority nursing action. It's best. So if I choose B, then I'm not stopping the insulin. So again, there's, that's like half the answer. Bolus with normal saline. I don't see how that's going to do anything. Start dextrose per protocol and reassess glucose in 15 minutes. Okay, so start dextrose per protocol and reassess glucose. Well, I can't, I, I really wanted to stop the insulin, but they're admitted on insulin for DKA. So I really, I can't remove the IV. And they have an IV, so I don't think I want to give an IM medication and C doesn't, do any help. So start dextrose per protocol and reassess glucose in 15 minutes. That's the only one that makes sense. That's the only one that makes any sense. So it doesn't say stop insulin, but maybe that's because they're admitted with DKA. So I think, would D be harmful? No, it would not be harmful. Would it be helpful? Yes, it would absolutely be helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and do that one. Uh, remember the right answer is the right answer because of the other answers. I don't know if D would have been, if I could have picked any answer possible out there, I'm not sure that D would have, would have been my, my first choice, but it's my first choice, my priority or best out of the four options that I have here. A client admitted with hypertensive crisis, means their blood pressure is high, is on a nicardipine drip, which lowers blood pressure. The order is to titrate nicard nicardipine to keep the systolic between 140 and 160. The client's current blood pressure is 118 over 72, which means their systolic is too low and the heart rate is 84. Their mentation is normal. What is the best nursing action? Well, if I have an order to keep it between 140 and 160, then I need to either turn off or turn down the nicardipine because the blood pressure is too low. Decrease nicardipine per protocol. That sounds good. Increase nicardipine per protocol. No, that's going to lower their blood pressure more. Add labetalol, IV push now. No, that's going to lower their heart rate and possibly their blood pressure. Maintain the current rate. No. So it's, it's the blood pressure is too low. So this is really saying, can you follow a doctor's order? But you have to know what the medication does as well. A client admitted with preeclampsia is on a magnesium infusion. After completing the morning assessment, the nurse notes the respiratory rate is 10 with absent deep tendon reflexes and urine output of 15 mils per hour, which is low. It's supposed to be at least 30. What is the priority nursing action? Select all that apply. So preeclampsia, the risk with preeclampsia is seizure, which is kind of the ultimate up symptom. As magnesium level goes up, it has down symptoms. So like as magnesium level goes up, heart rate goes down reflexes go down. The risk for seizure goes down because seizure is an up symptom, right? So that's why we're given mag sulfate. The problem is, is it are, is a respiratory rate of 10 an expected side effect or a complication or an adverse effect? And is absent reflexes an expected side effect or an adverse effect? And is low urine output an expected side effect or an adverse effect? These all three are adverse effects. Now, respiratory rate might go down, like it might go from 16 to 14 or 12, that's fine. But 10 is too low. Absent reflexes is, is, is bad. Urine output is very low. So these are, these are adverse effects. And when you have an adverse effect, you have to um, stop the med and call the healthcare provider. That's what you have to do. So let's see if those options are here. Increase the mag rate per protocol, no. Stop mag infusion, yes. Prepare to give calcium gluconate. So that is the, that is the antidote for both potassium and magnesium. So since they're, since they are symptomatic with adverse effects, it would be appropriate to give calcium gluconate, notify the healthcare provider. Yes. So definitely B and D, and then you have to know calcium gluconate is the antidote or will prevent the 
adverse effects. Administer Narcan, that's for opioids. Encourage fluids, that's not gonna, that's not gonna help. Okay, before chemo, a pick has no blood return. The site is clean with no pain. What is the priority nursing action? Okay, a pick line, peripherally inserted central catheter, goes in usually the upper arm and it threads uh, close to the heart and you can give TPN through it, antibiotics, potassium, whatever you want. But you're supposed to have a blood return just like any central line. It's clean with no pain. So what would I do? What is the priority? What's the best thing to do? Okay, reposition the arm, force flush with 20 mils, start chemo, remove the pick. Okay, I don't want to remove the pick and I don't want to start the chemo yet because I don't have any blood return. Do I want to force flush it or do I want to reposition the arm? So I'm going to reposition the arm. I am not going to force flush it. Um, I may call somebody to come up and evaluate it after I reposition the arm if I still can't get any blood return, but I am not going to force, force flush it. That's not something I would do. Okay, the RN is administering an IV that is a known vesicant. The patient begins to complain of burning at the site, and the nurse notices swelling around the catheter. Which of the following actions should the nurse anticipate? Select all that apply. So the problem with a vesicant is that it's not just an infiltrated IV, but the, the medication has gotten into the tissues around it, and it can kill those tissues. Like It can be a very serious problem big problem. And so you need to get the medication out of there and whatever you can't get out, you have to neutralize. And a lot of times the way we neutralize it, and I'm not saying this is for every way, but a lot of times what we do with neutralize it is we use a syringe with a needle and we actually inject medication into the tissues around that area. Um, that's just one of the things we do, maybe not always. So let's see what the actions are. Remove the catheter immediately. Um, I don't, the reason I don't like this is I don't like the word immediately because I may need to do something with that catheter before I remove it. I do want to remove it eventually, but I'm not sure that I want to remove it immediately. I'm always cautious when I see the word immediately. Um, stop the infusion. Absolutely. Aspirate the drug. Okay. So if I stop the infusion and I pull back, I do want to pull back because anything I can get out from the line itself, from the catheter itself, I want to get out of there because I don't want it to be allowed to continue to go out into the tissues. Because even if you stop the med, there, there's still some medication in the catheter. So I do want to get anything out that I can. Call for the antidote protocol. That's what I meant by neutralizing it. Um, you may inject something through the catheter that may be part of the antidote protocol. You may inject something into the skin around the catheter. Um, that may be part of the antidote protocol, but you have to do the, whatever the antidote protocol is. You have to do that. Elevate and apply heat. So if I elevate it and I apply heat, I'm bringing more blood to the area to be exposed to this vesicant, which I don't want to do. And I'm also allowing it to travel down the arm, which I definitely don't want to do. So I don't want to elevate and apply heat, restart IV distal to the current IV. No, I really don't want to do anything with that arm at this point. I, we're probably going to have to restart the IV. I may have to have a pick line place or central line place. I don't know what we're going to do as far as a new IV site, but it's not going to be in the same arm. That's for sure. Um, I'm thinking, especially distal. You never... You never do anything distally. Like if your IV infiltrates, you always restart something proximally. So like if my IV infiltrates in my forearm and then I restart it in the hand, well, then now it has to go past that infiltration point. That's not what I want. So if it infiltrates here, I can restart it up here so it doesn't go have to go past that, uh, that infiltrated part of that. So stopping the effusion, aspirate the drug and call for the antidote protocol. When should a trough level be drawn for scheduled Q12 vancomycin? So peaks and troughs. So peaks and troughs are drawn to determine if the drug, which has a, and vancomycin are part of the mycin drugs, like streptomycin, cleomycin, vancomycin, uh, gentamycin. These are called aminoglycosides. They have um, they can have some pretty serious adverse effects, and it has a narrow therapeutic index. So that means if it goes too high, it has those adverse effects. If it's too low, it's not working at all. So we draw peaks and troughs on drugs that have a narrow therapeutic index to make sure it's not too high or too low. The peak is the highest level. The trough is the lowest level. And it's always at its lowest level right before the next dose. So if I'm giving it every 12 hours, 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., I give it at 9 a.m., the trough or the lowest level is going to be right before the 9 p.m. dose, okay? 
All right, two hours after the infusion. No, uh, I don't know how long the infusion is gonna last, but you, you draw the peak 15 to 30 minutes after the medication is fully infused. That's the peak, 15 to 30 minutes after the medication is fully infused, within 30 minutes before the next dose, yes. So right before the next dose or within 30 minutes before the next dose is correct. With the morning labs anytime, no. That you can get, like if they're on an oral med and you wanna just get an, a blood level of the med, like they're on digoxin and you wanna get a dig level, like you can do that with the morning labs. You can get a dig level with the morning labs. But we're looking at an actual trough for IV meds and that's right before the next dose, before the first dose. Uh, no, they shouldn't have any of the med in their body before the first dose. So it's within 30 minutes uh, before the next dose. All right, I hope that was helpful to you, and I hope you are having a great holiday season. I am recording this during the Christmas season, New Year season, so if you're watching this later and it's not the holiday season, then enjoy the warm weather while I'm recording it. It's very cold, and we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. So if this is your holiday season, have a great holiday season. We love you here at Clinic Reviews. We want you to be successful. Send me a little note. Tell me how you did. If it was helpful to you, what can I do to help you more? There's some things I don't teach on because we teach it as part of the paid part of our business. Um, but if I can teach on it, we don't already do it as part of our paid business. I'd love to do that for you. So have a great rest of your day. Take care.